Welcome, welcome, everyone. Mia, Nina. <laughs> so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Peace and blessings. It's Amina. And welcome to our IG Live podcast, Unveiling Love, Stories, Community, and Social Change. This is a space where community leaders and artists discuss their defining moments that shape their effort in creating safety and unity in the community with true love. This is part of a Love Over Fear Oakland campaign organized by our family at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, defending the right of incarcerated, defending the humanity of immigrants, interfaith movement for human integrity works at the intersection of faith and social movements. So this campaign is a response to the challenges faced by communities of color in Oakland. Uh, we acknowledge, uh-oh, Nia, let me invite her back on. Instagram is always playing around. There you are. I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi. Oh, oh, no worries. We're gonna flow with technology. Like we're just gonna flow like water. But I was saying this campaign is a response to the challenges faced by communities of color in Oakland. And we acknowledge the root causes that disrupt safety and community collaborations. So through this podcast, through upcoming community concerts, art exhibition, we're here to create dialogue that will feature Black AAPI and Latin communities. One of the things I'm so honored and grateful for as a host on this podcast is to not only learn about the work of community leaders, but to learn about their personal journeys, what they had to overcome that led them to a decision that, you know what, the challenges that I face, I'm going to help others. And my guest today has a powerful, powerful journey to share with us. It's a story of immigration, domestic violence, jail, deportation, but above all, redemption. Rising above the great trials, Nia Nern is a feminist organizer strategist who works at the intersection of criminalization, immigration, and gender-based violence. She's the co-director of Asian Prisoner Support Committee, which supports the incarcerated and the release of AAPI and their families with community-based reentry services, anti-deportation campaigns, and other resources. She's also a steering committee member of the Survived and Punished, a prison abolition organization that focuses on freeing criminalized survivors and exposing the relationship between the systems of punishment and gender-based violence. We are in for a real, real treat because she's gonna share with us on how she's building collective people power to bringing a new world that is safer for all. Welcome, please welcome Nia Nern. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Mina, for having me, for inviting me to be part of the, the space. Um, I'm really grateful to be here and honored. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. So, so grateful to have you here because you have such a powerful, powerful, uh, journey to share with us and it's I'll be honest it's always a treat for me when I have I guess that are women that are leaders working in the community because it makes me think about women leadership the beautiful balance of strength resiliency but compassion and empathy and what women had to overcome to do this do this great work um, as a woman in the nation of Islam, we're taught that a nation can rise no higher than its women. And so the work for true freedom, a large part of that work is elevating the women. But most people may not know that 90% of the incarcerated women experience domestic violence and sexual assault before their incarceration. In addition to that, the prison to the ICE detention pipeline prolongs the devastation of gender-based violence. So I was wondering, can you share with us some of the challenges you face early in life and what did you discover about the relationship between systems of punishment and gender violence? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Amina. And thank you um, everyone that's listening and joining us during your lunch break or 
just really, um, again, I'm so very grateful. First, I want to say that um, this question is really deep to me um, as a Mina shared, right? Uh, my background as a survivor, as a domestic survivor, um, my life is at the intersection of um, gender-based violence, um, incarceration, detention, deportation, um, through my own experience, right? And also through my own lens observations uh, from my, um, even before um, my incarceration, um, as what Amina shared, 90% of people, right, um, are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assaults, even before their incarceration. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to you a little bit about my own experience as well. Um, but I will say that um, for me, as a, as a child, um, as a child of a refugee genocide survivor um, from Cambodia, right, um, especially Cambodians who are from backgrounds of uh, genocide, of war, um, right, that have migrated here, not because of, uh, because they wanted to, because our homes were annihilated, right? We were displaced, coming here as refugees. Um, and, and I feel like among um, people, like black, black communities, people of color, that there's that, um, that connection that we have, right, of surviving these forms of systems. And I will say in terms of women, when I talk about women, I'm talking about transgender women, black women, right, um, migrant women um, that have experienced the violence, right, in a system that has really perpetuated, that upholds, right, historically, as we know, um, um, in these systems, right, when you talk about cooperation, businesses, um, that really are predominantly um, dominated by men, and in the prison industrial complex, the prison in itself, you have to think about, like, how was it formed? How was it shaped, right, when slavery ended? Um, and who are incarcerated in prisons? When we think about prisons, we think about we, we think about men, right? Uh, and predominantly, yes, it's true that majority of incarcerated people are black men or people of color, right? Hispanics, but also at the same time, um, there's the, the really the underrepresentation, but ha it has gotten better of like who's incarcerated and the growing population of women, um, and. And the women that are incarcerated, it's because um, for, based on their gender, right, especially um, transgender women, right, experience of violence among law enforcement, um, women that have survived domestic violence um, abuses um, that really the court, the, the system does not understand, nor do they want to, because it's kind of like black and white, either you're innocent or you're guilty, or you're the one that you know, did harm, or you're the one that's considered the victim. So when you are a victim, but you're also considered a perpetrator, like how do you like mediate that? So the system is like a two tier in which, um, especially the stereotypes among place on women, right? As being nurturing caretakers. I think society has a hard time fathoming how, um, how can a woman um, hurt, you know, hurt or cause violence, but then they receive the most excessive form of sentencing, right, incarceration. Um, and after incarceration, especially being an immigrant, a refugee, or a migrant, they face a double punishment, right? These laws that were created, immigration laws that were, ra that were racist. Um, and when we're talking about like the 90% of women who experience um, violence, um, they, they experience these forms of violence, like through the, the, the cultural patriarchal norms, especially as Asian women, right? Um, Violence growing up, um, especially as as a parent, you know, as as a wife, as a ter caretaker, experiencing that through their um, interpersonal relationships, right? Um, and I, I think also, um, again, it's just these forms of um, violence that happens to women is continuing to grow. Um, it has gotten better, but at the same time, um, I think for myself, working as an organizer with Survived and Punished, um, we've had will deepen our political analysis, right, to really to challenge and dismantle these forms of systemic racism against women, against gender um, violence, um, have really expanded support for them, got them out of prison, but at the same time, there's still the increase of population, right, of um, the incarceration of women. Um, that's really has been pervasive and still growing. Wow. And I, you know, when we think of mass incarceration, we think of mainly 
men. And then, yes, it's from a lens of black and white. But we, you know, there's also issue of women. And then deeper into that is the domestic violence and the assault that we face. And how are we, um, how are we supporting? How are we supporting, you know, the stories? And how are you able to, because I know from your experience, you discover this relationship, right, between the systems of punishment and gender violence. Like, what did you discover? Um, that how is it connected, and what can we do to to help with that? Yeah, I mean, again, for myself, as a, I came here as that 1.5 generation born in a Thailand refugee camp, came here to the U.S. Uh, with a single mother, right, who has survived trauma, um, trauma from genocide, from war from um, sexual gender violence. Uh, my mother is a survivor of rape also. And I think for her being in a relationship with my stepfather, who was also a survivor um, of the Vietnam War, right? He was a soldier during that time. Um, so their relationships really was modeled to me as not, not very healthy. And um, even though I was was pretty much sheltered right in the neighborhoods I was lived at, but there was violence in the home. And um, the expectations, right, of being um, a, a Southeast Asian, a Cambodian, you know, young girl growing up into a woman very much um, is through this uh, not being, being valued, not being seen. And I continue to um, throughout, you know, as I grew up and witnessing the violence that was happening to my mother um, by my stepfather, um, I didn't know how to ask for help, you know, knew that I was wrong. Um, at the same time, um, relatives and also um, community members, right, that my mom had um, shared this about, they would say, well, it's always like blaming the victim. What did you do wrong? Or go back, you know, um, he provides for your children. And, um, and that law enforcement was not there to protect us, nor did they care because we were seeing what was unraveling around our neighborhoods that was happening to our black, you know, and um, Hispanic community members, right? The violence that they were experiencing, especially the youth at that time um, that were joining gangs or, or being involved in these types of, um, of behaviors just really to find identity and belonging, right? Um, and especially living in poverty at that time, it's just, the, the scarcity that we're all living and the fear of like the language fear as well, right? Seeking support. Um, so with myself growing up in, to it, in my teenage years, um, not really knowing what healthy relationships were or you know what I saw on TV, what was modeled to me, I found myself in a very abusive relationship with a man twice my age. Um, and with that, I, 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 learn that in order um, to find that comfort, to feel that sense of belonging, that um, I did whatever I could, you know, as a teenager, I mean, as we all can relate, like being a teenager, I'm thinking we're in love, you know, feeling accepted and wanted, still trying to find our identity. Um, and then, yes, so I made some un choices that were, that led up to my incarceration, right? At, at the same time, I, I knew like the choices that I made, my background, my life experience, was very similar to the people that I met, right? Um, who I, um, throughout my time incarceration that I um, connected with, became friends. They even were like family members to me that we all came from similar backgrounds, right? In terms of experiencing these types of violence that was happening to us before incarceration, um, especially as women, the gender violence that we were um, receiving. Right, right, right. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, what you have lifted about the challenges of youth, Asian youth, you know, growing up in Oakland or growing up in marginalized communities. Sometimes I feel like it's not as talked about um, and, you know, especially our mental health, right? Um, recently, I was at a community rally for uh, Yong Yang, a Korean man that was, um, was killed by the LAPD during a mental health crisis you know so um we definitely i feel there's an opportunity to really talk about the challenges um that we face growing up as refugees and you know being children of immigrants um earlier in our episodes i had eddie zane um who yeah was speaking about 
the importance of collective learning. And I think that will really help, you know, with this issue about learning each other's history, learning about each other's challenges. And he was part of the San Quentin Three, right? Mm -hmm. Mike Mo and Rico Remedio, who advocated for ethnic studies in San Quentin. And how collective learning is, you know, breaking down these barriers as well as in prison and can help with the real work in, in creating freedom. Mm -hmm. So what makes me, it, it makes me think about how the many that are incarcerated, um, especially like, you know, immigrants and survivors of sexual and domestic violence, they're immediately transferred to a federal and immigration and ICE detention, despite their transformation or great work in the community. And folks may not really, you know, understand and know that. And they're like remaining in immigration limbo. Mm -hmm. You as a co-director of Asian Prisoner Support Committee really focuses on this specific issue. Can you tell us um, the work that you do and especially the deportation defense campaigns and how can we support that? Yeah. Yes, um, the Asian Prisoner Support Committee uh, was, we, we recently just had our 20 year anniversary um, and Eddie Zhang, one of our co-founders who was a guest last week. Um, I, I really, you know, when I think about Asian Prison Security Committee's work, I think about the history, how it um, got involved. Um, Yuri Koshiyama, our, our great civil um, rights Japanese American, who also co-founded APSC. And I really draw on terms of their legacy, the, the role that they paid, like the opportunity for me um, and especially my staff who are also formerly incarcerated and um, our whole staff in general, right, who are system impacted to be in this work, um, how much that it takes really, um, it takes all of us, you know, the collectiveness to, um, to form an organization, an organization that was um, through, right, through Eddie's experience, um, the, um, that might know and Rico Remedio, right, based on their fight because they wanted to fight for ethnic studies and San Quentin and the prison was not trying to have it. And they were um, isolated, right, um, in solitary confinement. And that's how, because of their, you know, they were demanding rights, right? Still, still, they still have rights, even though we're incarcerated, like to learn, to engage your minds, you know, for ethnic studies. And what AP, what the Asian Prison Support Committee does is really, um, really drawing in the connections around the growing numbers of APIs, um, incarceration, deten detention, and deportation. Uh, because I think, you know, when it comes to incarceration, um, it's either you're categorized under as black, white, other, or Hispanic. And Asians fall under the other category as Native Americans, right? Also um, amongst other um, um, ethnicities. And I, being for the Asian Prison Support Committee, I'm really um, honored to be part of an organization, right? That gets to, to lead and draw the connections and highlights the importance of what collective um, solidarity work is, especially um, when we're talking about criminal justice, immigrant rights, um, gender justice, any word that ends with justice, you know, I, I think um, for us as, as an organization, we have that background, right, to, to draw that, especially with the, the legacies that APSC has left, um, especially with Yuri's work, right, as a civil rights movement leader, with her work at that time with, um, during the civil rights era, right, with Malcolm X, I, I think for us is to say like, we all need to work together to identify like, um, yes, APSC, you know, supports, um, you know, advocacy rights, immigrants uh, justice for APIs, but other marginalized community. And, um, and why is it important really to also on the policy to work together, you know, with our Latinx community um, in terms of immigrant justice to stop ICE transfers of people, right? Especially immigrants and refugees that have served time in prison, right? Like myself, um, that have uh, been to the parole process, spent 15, 20 years, but at the same time, the same system that says we can be paroled, hand us over to ICE for detention, deportation proceedings, in which some of us when, are definitely incarcerated in ICE detention, or some, um, because of the deteriorating conditions, ICE detention, they give up, you know, they deport, you know, they are exiled into countries that is not even their home mm -hmm. when all their families are here. Mm -hmm. um, so APSC does that type of work 
and also individual campaigns, right? Um, campaigns of um, communities that we have worked with inside that were incarcerated, that were part of our Restoring Our True Original Self Ethnic Studies program, right? That was co-founded by Eddie. Um, and freedom campaigns for them to come home uh, to stop their ICE transfer, like Chantan Bun, who's currently our, our staff, who's part of the APSC4 campaign, because four of our staff members um, are facing detention and deportation, uh, and they're sitting in limbo, right? So the APSC4 campaign, I can definitely talk more of it. And while I'm sharing this, we also have a web website, the Asian Prison Support Committee, um, so folks can look at the various campaigns that we worked on, and also current existing campaigns for the APSC4, right, to urge Governor Newsom to pardon them. Um, and for us as, you know, as an organization, we also like when it comes to transformative justice and like through healing, um, we also love, you know, really centered like the lives of those that we worked with that have been impacted, you know, by these injustices with these systems and also working with their loved ones. And also those that have been deported too, we work to still maintain to have that relationship with them, um, just despite them being in in a country that they don't want to find ways to connect with them through our um, formerly incarcerated internship program that we do, and also um, through like mutual aid support, right, to make sure they have care packages. So just really staying connected and giving hope, you know, to people because I think hope is really a word that's really um, that's powerful and also that connects and draws because that's what kept me alive was hope when I was inside, mm -hmm. and hope out here, you know, is so much needed, especially. In the in the in the world that we're living in, right? Um, and and I feel that with our work, you know, with collective liberation, um, and time, you know, with engaging with other communities of color, like local partner organization, like with Interfaith for Human Integrity, like we love them so much because um, it's right the interconnectedness, the really the work to how do we. Um, make it inclusive in terms of equity, inclusion, and diversity for all people, right? Not just for some people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe, when speaking about collective liberation, do you believe that there's enough attention to this part of Asian history, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander history, and the issue of immigration and deportation and mental mm -hmm. health? And, you know, do you think? there's enough attention if not why do you think that is yeah sorry can you repeat that question again? do you think there's enough attention to those mm -hmm. specific issues that mm -hmm. you're lifting about our you know asian american native hawaiian pacific mm -hmm. community you know as far as mm -hmm. the prison the deportation the you know transferring to the ice you know detention right after being released do you think we're getting enough attention and if not mm -hmm. why do you think that is i, I will say since the last seven years since I've been home, there has been more attention. Um, I will say, for example, the issues of um, APIs, incarceration, detention, and deportation, and really preventing, right, pre preventing them from being transferred over to ICE, um, keeping them home, right, here in, in the U.S. with their families, has grown, has been expansive, have been a growing movement. Mm -hmm. um, APSC has been very honored to work with the ICE Out of California right, Coalition, in which uh, actually it started at one of our APSC's office meetings that we used to have before COVID back in 2018. We were trying to figure out strategies. How can we prevent our community members that are in incarcerated in prison that have, that's going to be transported to ICE to, pre to prevent them, right, to keep them home? And then we're like, well, can we get the support of elected officials? Can we pass legislation to do that? Um, and then we thought to ourselves, can we really commit an official to support us to say like immigrants or refugees who are incarcerated, right? Um, deserve right, an opportunity to remain in the US and that they have served their time and why should they be punished further? But so we, with our coalition support, we started building the narratives right especially people that have been impacted um that have been home right um, like my staff um, people like myself or folks that i work with also including like domestic violence survivors who have gone through the immigration system and the incarceration system um, building building on the narratives and that um 
if we're talking about criminal justice reform, right? Because California is supposed to be one of the most leading state that um, that provide opportunities for people that serve time, free entry support, you know, that's growing. Why should immigrants also be excluded, right? Immigrants that don't have, um, you know, legal status. Why does being undocumented, why does being a permanent resident, why do we allow this immigration, you know, laws that is really racist, you know, from the start to really inform, um, to say like, there are community members are not deserving of it. So for the last couple of years, um, we've been building that movement, right? We've got labor unions, um, national, you know, uh, Congress, uh, Congress people to support. We've passed um, through the Oakland City Council resolution supported um, by by mayors that time and Mayor Libby, um, not sorry, Mayor uh, Sheng Tao, Mayor Sheng Tao, who that time was a, um, right on on the the council. She had helped have resolutions. It's just the city, like, and that's why I love Oakland, <laughs> Oakland itself. Um, right. Able to support individual campaigns, or even through my own campaign, my own my own party campaign that got me, um, got my my clemency granted, which is you know I'm grateful that I'm here at home today, getting the, to do the work that I do. Really like the support of support of elected unions, um, activists, you know, um, really like even celebrities, I mean, just really people that, that, that feel like, well, how's, how is this issue related to me? I go, it is, it's an issue that everyone should be concerned about because for example, if your daughter or your, your child or your family member is going to school and you see this child here in the corner, right? Um, very quiet and shy and, and not talking because he's worried about his father and his mother is going to get, you know, detained and deported. It's that mm -hmm. intergenerational, you know, um, trauma and cycle that we got to think about. Like, it does Im impact all of us if we want to live in a world that's safe, you know, that it's inclusive, that's fair. Um, right? So I, you know, and since then, it's like the issues of API incarceration, detention, deportation has grown, um, especially when we see our like API electeds, you know, that's here, right, here um, locally and in the state, they've supported you know, our campaigns, our work, our policies, APSC's work, they've spoken on it. Um, and I, I do think like, um, if you thought about it 10 years ago about, about California working to um, end collusion with ICE, I don't, I, I think that was like an impossibility, but I think anything that is worth fighting for is definitely worth um, really, I know it, the fight is hard, but at the same time, it's like, um, if we want rights for APIs for you know everyone that I think we have to collectively think together, like how to push through that and find ways, you know, strategies to really um, come together and really broaden, you know, engage more people into the movement. That's right, that's right. You know, learning about the system learning more about the systems of punishment and its effect on the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community. And then now also seeing those same systems and seeing how to treat the student mm -hmm. protest against uh, genocide on these college campuses. You know, how important is it for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community to stand in solidarity with Palestine and why? I think it's very important because I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, but I sometimes I don't. I wonder if you know, especially for folks that identify as A, A and H, HPI or API. I think you have to understand like our history, how we got here today. You know, through imperialism, colonialism, you know, settler colonialism, and that. How do we get our rights today? You know, how do we? You know especially how do we get the rights to vote? How do we get the rights to uh, migrate here, you know, immigrate here, to, you know, to the U.S.? And how do we um, are, are in positions of um, positions of positions and places where we were able to have power, like being elected officials or, or even like uh, influence for gaining, you know, being API influencer gaining influence or being in positions like myself. I, I will say, you know, it's, I think we have to remember, like, through the civil rights era, you know, through our black leaders and movement leaders that were able to pave that way, through other API movement leaders like Yuri, right, um, Grace Leah Box, were able to do that. And I think we forget, especially with the issues, 
especially with um, the, with the genocide that's happening in Palestine and the student movement that that grew right um, over a month ago. Where did it start? Um, I think we have to remember, like during the Vietnam era, when the war was happening, how San Francisco State and how like the, the black you know the black movement really came together and fought for ethnic studies, right? Um, you know, the third, you know, third world's liberation front, how was that created? I think we have to go back and realize like, we got here today because of what, what, what happened, right? The, the legacy that happened that opened up for us. And I just feel, and I, you know, I'm really grateful to be in space with partners, with other A and HBIs that get it, that are doing the work, doing what they can, right? Supporting, you know, um, our Palestinian leaders that have been doing this work even before the October 7th, right? They've been doing this very long time. And I feel like when I hear about APIs talking about they don't feel safe or they don't feel like it's their issue, you know, it's a Palestinian issue, but aren't you paying tax? I mean, aren't this government, this so-called democratic government is funneling, is giving money to, uh, for this genocide, right? Where they should be focusing on our, us, our people here, focusing on poverty, focusing on education, or you know, the mass incarceration pressures that they have. But, you know, I think people forget, like, these same systems that APIs are fighting against, it's the same system that's funneling, you know, supporting this genocide. So I, I think people sometimes, like, they said, well, because what is my one, uh, what is my one voice is going to do? What is my one vote? You know, it's going to matter. I think if 7 million people said all of that, we wouldn't be here today in which um, right now it's like there's so much growing movement, you know, for the Palestinian liberation, right? Um, yes, when you talk, talk about the student movement, they're continuing to find any ways that effort to do so. Um, I think we all have a role to play, um, you know, as humans, you know, who ha we have our own moral values in terms of our compass. Uh, so like, I'm, I'm privileged, right? As you are, Mina, that we are able to do the work that we do in our homes, get to um, have food on our table, get to go out and get fresh air. And when lives are being taken every day, right? And that is connected, tied to the same system of government that's supposed to, you know, protect and supposed to serve, that's supposed to, you know, equality, you know, and all that fighting for immigrant justice and fighting for all these forms of justice. But at the same time, we have a government that cannot be trusted, <laughs> that we have to hold them accountable, right? Especially recently um, with the Biden administration um, halting the, you know, the asylum ban that happened at the border, right? Um, I, I think, you know, it's really concerning, like our government is turning to a fascist, you know, it's fascism that it's on the rise. And um, it's really, and I think we have to be ready. And I think it, you know, it takes everyone, right? Uh, whether you feel like you don't know enough, right? To educate yourself about the history of Palestine or uh, what's going on. But if you could take action just to mutual support, you know, go join a rally, walk along the sidelines, you know, like I think numbers, being in numbers together really, um, it's that power, you know, that draws. And I feel that it's really working and going because um, in a way I feel that the government is trying to appease us, like giving us like little scraps. But at the same time, you know, we know like the fear mongering that they're doing, the fear language. And for me, you know, you know, as a woman, as API women, especially with an organization that have, you know, that are um, survivors of genocide, you know, of, um, of carpet bombings, our, our history is really tied to, to the Palestinian, you know, people, our liberation. Um, yes, so I really feel like as an API of anything, you should be the one alongside, right, out there and not saying, what's this not my issue, which I feel it's, it's all, all, all of the issues. Right, right. You know, as a Chinese daughter of immigrants and looking into my history, I was born in San Francisco, Chinatown, and looking into the history and activism there, looking deeper in, you know, going way I see the connection to the struggle in Palestine, to what's going on in Congo, what's going on in Sudan, you know. So, yes, you know, as, uh, you know, Asia here in America, we have such a big role to play when it, when it comes to fighting against genocide. Um, U.S. imprisons and deports 
most people in any other country, yet we don't feel safe in their view of what, what's, what is, what defines safety? So what is your vision for a safe Oakland, safe and peaceful Oakland? What's your vision for that? What does that mean? So my vision for a peaceful Oakland, you know, I, I live here along the lake and I, you know, I love it when I see um, people out here having picnics, just enjoying each other's company and just strolling, taking a walk. And what I envision, you know, I want to see our elders walk without having to feel nervous. I want our elders to be able to don't have to walk in groups, right? To be just to take a stroll if they wanted to, to feel safe. Um, I personally have had a few black elders, um, some Asian elders and come up to me and um, you know, I, you know, for me as, as an Asian woman of color, I, I really like, I feel Oakland is safe for me. I can take a run around the lake, which I haven't been able to run because I have a sprained ankle, but even just to step outside in front of my park. And, um, I, I remember a, a black elder woman, she, she tapped me. She said, did you hear about what happened around the lake? And I said, yes, I heard about, you know, the, the accident that happened. She said, you know, I, I was attacked and I've been attacked actually quite frequently. I just want you know to be safe. And I say, well, I want you to know that I want you to feel safe and how can I help you be safe? So I said that all to say is like checking in with even people you don't know or people like, you know, strangers and making eye contact and saying like, I see you, right? Um, going and I Oakland has really a lot of like free community like spaces um, where we can go to and you know the art the, the beauty and the art that you know that's around Oakland I, I go to it when I can and just really seeing that diversity of communities right the engagement um, to say and especially Oakland like how how the Black Panther how like the progressive movement started here and I feel such really to me you know I've been here for seven years for, for seven years, I lived in the Bay and actually from San Diego. Um, Oakland is just a, a, a really um, diverse you know, culture and environment that I feel really safe. And I, and I will say like not, some people don't feel safe, you know, because of, uh, but at the same time, I think it also start with like dialogues within the communities, you know, of degrees of color. Like, um, I know there's like shifting of blame towards, you know, one community and the other, but I feel having like, that started that dialogue, why they feel hurt, um, why they feel, you know, that distrust. Um, I think it all comes from a place of like um, ex personal experiences, that traumas that happen to people, right? And um, I really do like appreciate the organizations that's doing like solidarity work, um, racial justice work together, right? Um, to really to draw in our own um, um, per personal experience, but also organization, you know, work among our communities. Um, and I also say, I. A safe Oakland for me is being able to really um, for pe people to to come together to to really just to celebrate the history of Oakland, and I don't want to Oakland to come together because of tragedies, um, if that makes sense, right? Um, and especially you know with with people that have been killed, you know, through gun violence, um, you know, through through law enforcement. And Oakland would be safe if there was no police, you know, I, you know, to defund the police work. It's really, I feel um, that it is crucial at the same time. Um, I, I feel that it's going to continue to be strengthened, especially around, you know, the work around Stop Cop City, right? That's happening around the nation. Um, I feel that if we're able to draw that connections, you know, and the type of work that we're doing, right, to create safety for our communities, um, if we want that it, it starts really, you know, with, with us, you know, as individuals being open, you know, to, um, to, to learning and understanding, right, our histories, our, the challenges that other communities go through, right, bridging, right, bridging each other, um, learning how to bridge and how do we kind of collectively support and heal each other. So that is my thought. Yeah, peace builders, yeah. peace builders, yeah. Um, for those that have questions for Nia, this is the time to type it in the comments section as we're uh, approaching the last few moments of our interview. But I always ask my guests, and you probably already touched upon it in your last answer, but if we did a public presentation of unveiling, unveiling the face of love, you know, everything 
that you've been through your journey and you know that has defined the work that you do today what does the face of love look like to you pull off the veil <laughs> It's a beautiful question. The face of love is our, our community. When I think the face of love, I think about, I think about right, our community members that we've worked with that are inside, that are currently inside people that are out here that have gained their freedom. I think about the loved ones that have lost their loved ones, right? I think about um, just a room full of people that have survived so much trauma but at the same time like that resilience that they have right i i want to hear like what what gives them hope right what really um inspire them continue them to move you know the way that they move that um that love is really the answer right the love is the answer to to the issues that we have today and um i really want to see other 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 people being able to just share from their heart um, what safety means to them, right? What what is um, mean to them, their family and their loved ones in the community? Um, what what can we offer, right? Support that we can offer each other. And, and yeah, I think I think the world. I mean, the room would be packed, you know. And I think with food too, great food. <laughs> so I love food, and um, I think like you know. Food is love, so just being able to sit down and share uh, meals together and just really honor each other's right, our presence, our space, um, and how to really think through what healing looks like for ourselves and our community and what collective liberation could, could look like. Right, right. As you're, as you're speaking, I'm feeling, I'm envisioning a space where, a safe space where we can learn more about each other instead of just communicating through a lens you know you're part of this organization or you're labeled this but actually learning and speaking to each other in about you know um our paths as individuals and what makes us you know who we are um i have to ask you this because as a woman organizing and learning and trying to find strategies on uh collective healing it, it can be very heavy work you know um, and as women we feel we feel deeply naturally right so what is some form of self-care or any spiritual practice you that you have that will help you and maintain you and maintain your well-being and to continue to do this work yeah thank you, thank you for that question um and i feel that that question is really especially think with the genocide that's happening and I think self-care in a way can feel like really um, selfish if that's the right word right I think I myself feel this and I know um, other friends and folks have shared with me it's like they feel guilty um, focusing on their well-being and mental health um, but I feel like being in this movement work um, being in this movement work especially in the long term right and I feel that um, that rest is really crucial, right? As you may heard, like rest is resistance, right? Especially in a society that's really built on capitalism, you know, for like individualism and right and all that. Um, but I, I feel like the only way that we can sustain ourselves and grow our movement is also to really check in with each other, but also what is like self-care that feels good um, to me? So going back to that question. So it's been a challenge for me, I will say. Um, but I, I do, you know, I also have to remember, like, I have not been home for a long time. Um, I've been away, right, from my community for almost two decades. And I think also self-care is also reminding myself to, like, work on my healing and forgiveness for myself, right? Um, I'll be honest with you, I think as, you know, as, a, as an Asian woman, as, um, as a privileged woman, I, I feel sometimes like I don't, I, I can rest when I feel that I need to rest, but I feel like by the time you feel like you need to rest, it's like you're already at that breaking point. <laughs> so I, yes, for me, like trying to find that balance, um, it has worked on and off, but I, I think that 
for now, self care for me is um, just turning off everything and just being in my home, um, enjoying a cup of tea and you know some fruits, and really just um, when I can just tune into my body, like you know what I'm feeling and looking forward to the moments that I have, right? Especially the connections that I, you know, build and friends that I have to know, like, um, we need each other, right? Um, I think for me as an introvert, I tend to feel like I don't want to like, especially burden my friends with, you know, things that I go through, but I feel like we need each other to spend time. Um, I, I know, like, for me being home, like being, you know, adulting when I still have to like make time with my friends. Um, I, I like, you know, I like that being able to, you know, connect with each other, um, enjoy a meal together, catch up with each other, right? And I live here along the lake. I have to remind myself, like, breathe. You know, through Eddie always telling me, you know, breathe. breathe. <laughs> yeah, yes, breathe as uh, your chi. And yeah, so those are some of the things I, I realized that I, um, and that's, that's what self-care is for me, just slowing down, um, grounding myself, being present, right? and know that it's okay to take time for yourself, you know, to sustain myself. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Yes. I definitely um, understand how you feel because I feel like as a woman in this type of work, I find myself indulging and appreciating the simple things. So just, you know, the quiet solitude, uh, uh, a few friends um, connecting with, he, a fruit plate, you know, we love our fruit, you know, <laughs> um, it just, uh, just being in nature and quiet. But I wish you more moments of rest because the work that you've done for the community, for the liberation of all is so impactful and so strong. And so thank you for inspiring so many people, including myself. It's an honor to have you here as a guest and spending the day with me. Thank you so much. And uh, is there any like last um, things that you want to share with with folks? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, yeah, thank you for asking that. I want to encourage um, for, for the audience who are, thank you for taking your time to join us to really, um, you know, I, I feel that we all have really busy lives and we have so many responsibilities, especially the multiple hats that you're juggling, right? Whether you're a parent, um, whether you're a puppy parent like myself, um, or- Puppy parent. Or, yes, are, are going through our own personal like challenges, working our own like um, with family, with work. I, I do think that um, if, you know, especially if you're in the movement work, like it's okay to to rest right it's okay to take time for yourself but i think like reminding each other like the power that we have right the collective power to make change um it's really you know it's incredible um for me being home for the past seven years um, i've you know i've experienced this wins you know i've but also at the same time losses but i know through this wins it's because of um, the, the engagement, right, um, especially the talents, the attributes of, of people to, to know like what it takes um, to free us, right, or to, to create safety for us. Um, because I, I do think like being able to, again, take time to draw the connections, right, whether it be just being open to perhaps doing like maybe a small thing, maybe signing a petition, right, or getting to know about what the organization does or attending a, you know, an event, a community event. I think you know, that's how people like really become radicalized or just being open to say, hey, I'm interested in doing this. But what, you know, what I'm saying is I don't expect people to like become, um, become you know, knee deep in this work like you know, I myself and folks that I work with. But I, I think like we all have a part to play, right, um, in, in this, in this, in, in this world, in our lives, right? That um, that as humans, we don't live like single, you know, issues live. Kind of like this reminds me of Audre Lorde's quote, right? We don't mm. live English. We don't live single issues live. It's not, it's not in a vacuum, right? So like we're all connected in any, you know, each 
you know, form or fashion, you know. Um, so I, I think like, again, uh, being open to um, having that eyes and, you know, opening your heart, just, it takes one single like planting a seed to someone to like, right. Um, this makes me think about people that were working, like, who are anti-immigrants or anti-prisoners. We've been able to draw them. I mean, you know, especially like politicians, which could be a challenge mm -hmm. to really like to make them understand. And it takes time, but I think like movement building work is not easy. You know, we have to really weave and really change things, you know, and because I, I don't think, I don't want, you know, history to repeat itself, right? Sure. I, I want us to really create an, a world where um, that is inclusive, where we all feel safe, that really, um, especially for our generations, where right, our future generations to come. So I just want to emphasize that. Um, it's not easy, but, but we, all, we all can do it. Yes. <laughs> and like you said, we all have a role to play. It's not like big or small or any, no, anything um, that you feel in your heart, you are a gift to this movement. And I hope folks can take that away today. Thank you for your spirit, your beautiful energy in this space. And I pray you have a restful day. Some, somewhere today you find some time to enjoy some simple moments of gratitude. Much blessing to you, Nia. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a safe and blessed day and I'll see you in the next episode. Peace and blessings. Salam alaikum. Thank you, Thank you, Nina. Thank you. And I hope to connect and see you in Oakland very yes, soon. Yeah. I will be there. So um, I look our, forward our to meeting you. Our anthology event. Um, anthology oh, yeah. event, June 29th. Look, yes. Follow APSC on Instagram. <laughs> A Asian Prisoner SC. <laughs> what's, the, what's the tag? Um, it's APSC, right? And yes. It's at Asian Prisoner at SC. At Asian Prisoner SC. Okay, yeah. the date was June, June 29th. June. Yes, there's a link to the event on yes, one to four in Oakland. Wow. Yes, hope to see some of you all there. All right, Oakland family, you heard it. <laughs> Please go and support. Have a safe and blessed day, everyone. Sure. Peace. Assalamu alaikum.